Well, welcome everyone. It's nice to see so many people joining our webinar today. We have over 130 registrants. I'm excited to see the names of so many familiar people who have registered for this event, as well as many new names of people that I don't know, but I am sure will bring a lot to this discussion we're having today. My name is Tim Whitehouse. I am the Executive Director of Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, or PEER. For those of you who don't know, uh, PEER is a national nonprofit organization that represents government whistleblowers without charge who are disclosing government wrongdoing related to environmental and public health issues. We also work with current and former government employees, usually anonymously, to address issues through official channels and to bring hidden information to the light of day. We often ask government oversight bodies to investigate improper or illegal government actions. This helps ensure that elected leaders in the public have the information they need to make better decisions. As we approach Whistleblower Appreciation Day on July 30th, PEER and the Government Accountability Project, or GAP, our co-sponsor for the event and an organization we often work with, thought now was the time to discuss and highlight a very important public health issue, EPA's failure to protect the public from toxic chemicals and pollution, some of the causes for that failure, and the profound impact that whistleblowers are having in catalyzing tangible reforms and policy changes at the agency level. There are many reasons we need to have this discussion. In my opinion, toxic pollution and exposure to toxic chemicals should be on par with the threats of climate change and biodiversity loss. And in fact, they're often intertwined with one another. We think, and many of you on this uh, call may agree, that EPA is not doing its job to protect the public from toxic health threats. So let's jump right in. To start out, Leslie Pacey of GAP and Dr. Robert Kutrill will discuss the tragedy of East Palestine and share firsthand insights into this tragedy, EPA's role in this tragedy, and some of the victories ach achieved in exposing the environmental and health impacts from this derailment. We'll then move on to Dr. Kyla Bennett, who will discuss EPA's representation of five whistleblowers who worked for or have worked on chemical issues at EPA and peers' role in making disclosures on their behalf. Next, Leslie and Kyla will offer recommendations on how to improve EPA. We'll end uh, today's discussion with questions you may have. Time permitting, we can also take a few questions for Leslie and Robert after they speak and a few questions after Kyla speaks. In the interest of time, I'll ask Leslie and Robert and Kyla to briefly introduce themselves before they speak. If you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A at any time. We'll be monitoring it throughout the, uh, throughout the panel discussions. So without taking up any more time, I'd like to turn it over to Leslie. Leslie? Hi, thank you, Tim, and thanks for having us at Government Accountability Project. Um, I am a senior environmental officer for um, Government Accountability Project, and we have been embedded in East Palestine investigating the train derailment there and the EPA's response to it. We have a presentation for you, uh, which we titled uh, Dangerous Decisions and Disinformation. Next slide. Um, Government Accountability Project, in case you're not familiar with us, um, we're the nation's leading whistleblower protection organization. Um, trying to get off that full screen there. Um, and through litigating whistleblower cases, publicizing concerns and developing legal reforms, GAP's missions to protect the public interest by promoting government and corporate accountability. Founded in 1977, Government Accountability Project is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, advocacy organization located in Washington, DC. Our Environment, Energy and Climate Division also investigates environmental disasters like the Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill. Next slide. Um, okay, so what brought GAP to East Palestine? Uh, on February 3rd, 2023, 
a freight train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, as most of you already know. Norfolk Southern uh, was carrying uh, hazardous materials on its uh, train when 52 of the 150 cars derailed. Uh, we launched an investigation into the train derailment and subsequent decision to burn the train cars hauling vinyl chloride and other chemicals in August after independent scientist Scott Smith began finding elevated levels of dioxins in and around East Palestine. Meanwhile, residents were also suffering from horrific health symptoms and the creeks were showing visible contamination. Meanwhile, the EPA was saying that the air and the water in East Palestine were safe and they were um, uh, continuing to rely on Norfolk Southern's paid consultants and doing little of their own testing to make that important determination. This clear conflict of interest where the responsible party funds the environmental sampling is the status quo for chemical disasters. Since Smith started challenging the official narrative, Norfolk Southern has subpoenaed his test results and communications, and Scott is one of our citizen whistleblowers. Next slide, please. And I would just put a few visual slides in here so that you can see some of the issues that residents have been experiencing since the derailment and the burning of the chemicals. Um, there's been a lot of skin and hair reactions, um, and this is just a few of the symptoms. I mean, there's seizures, all kinds of horrific things that we've heard about, um, and they're continuing to have health issues in East Palestine. Next slide, please. GAP's investigation into East Palestine uh, includes a people's report in which we take statements from residents, independent scientists, and whistleblowers, We've made three trips to East Palestine since the derailment in February of 2023. We also conduct research and file Freedom of Information Act requests to federal agencies to facilitate that deep dive. Since August, we filed multiple EPA public, uh, public records requests, one in which led to a lawsuit against the EPA. We also have filed FOIAs, the CDC and FEMA. Our investigation is ongoing and will result in a report that is shared with the media as well as lawmakers in an effort to create change. Uh, we rely heavily on residents, scientists, witness and whistle witnesses, and whistleblowers to share information crucial to shaping the true narrative and exposing government corruption and complacency. Next slide, please. Um, in East Palestine, GAP has found a series of dangerous decisions that put public health at risk. The decision to delay deployment of the Aspect airplane for five days, then turning the chemical sensors off over contaminated creeks when it did eventually fly. Uh, of course, you're going to hear from Robert Crowdell, one of our whistleblowers, who um, really detailed all of the uh, issues with the Aspect airplane here in just a minute. Uh, the decision to vent and burn five vinyl chloride train cars, which we now know uh, was not necessary. Uh, the decision to lift the evacuation with only scant, mostly upwind ground and roving monitoring data, and only testing of two homes inside the homes. And the decision to delay community dioxin testing until March while burying dioxin waste sampling data in thousands of pages of EPA documents on its website. Contrary to EPA's public reassurances that dioxin was not a concern in East Palestine, that data does show uh, railroad contractors already found dioxin levels nearly 20 times above EPA's own action levels. Next slide, please. I think that's um, okay. So also we did find the decision to rely on Norfolk Southern contractors to provide public health reassurances throughout the response was a, another dangerous decision that was made. Um, the decision to ignore the scope and enormity of the toxic plume. Recent studies have shown that the plume impacted 16 US states as well as Canada. And rain collected in those states after the plume showed elevations in chloride, which is linked to the vinyl chloride. Uh, the decision to not notify the public of vinyl chloride pockets found as recently as spring of 2024 and the decision to tell residents to eat from their gardens. Uh, currently, we have a petition into the EPA, which we're still waiting to hear from. It's been about a month since we filed the petition, and it's uh, the duty to warn residents should be the EPA's duty based on statutes. Uh, they did none of their own dioxin testing. Um, 
neither did any state group, and uh, they also did none of their own testing on gardens in East Palestine, yet they encouraged residents to eat from their crops. Meanwhile, Scott Smith, who uh, is one of our whistleblowers, found very high levels of diapsin in the garden. So um, still waiting to hear back on that. Next slide. Um, okay, it's, it's Robert's turn. I'm really uh, excited for you to meet Dr. Robert Crowdle. Um, he's an expert chemist and EPA data expert for the past 20 years. Um, he's our EPA whistleblower and former EPA contractor. So Robert, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Um... So I'm Dr. Robert Crodel, or Bob Crodel, as everybody uh, calls me, my colleagues call me. So uh, I've been involved with the ASPECT program since 1984. We started developing this uh, technology for real-time emergency response uh, uh, detection of chemical vapors in 84 in within DOD. Uh, we've supported a variety of different government agencies that are listed on this particular slide. In 2000, uh, uh, after 9-11, 2001, uh, Christy Todd Whitman, the director of the US EPA, the afternoon of 9-11 had heard a briefing from us on this aspect aircraft chemical real-time chemical sensors within the DOD uh, organization as, and she elected to transfer that that afternoon from the Department of Defense to the US EPA. Now everybody needs to remember we did not have DHS or any of the uh, various uh, state and local governments and federal uh, disaster assistance organizations that we do now. And so EPA was the only organization with a legal authority to basically fly over somebody's house or a uh, chemical plant and actually collect uh, chemical information over the site. So that's one might think this application should be in Department of Homeland Security or the National Guard today. It ended up getting transferred to the US EPA and there's where it sits. Our federal government has exactly one airplane that's an emergency response airplane to detect chemicals. It's this picture, it's a single engine, small little aircraft and that uh, provides the entire nation with, uh, that's the entire capability that the federal government has to detect chemicals during an emergency response. And a uh, number of, of colleagues of mine believe that that's way too uh, limited to provide any kind of uh, uh, capabilities for the entire United States, but this is all the capabilities that the United States uh, government has uh, today in the event of a train car derailment or a chemical plant uh, experiment. Aspect is the only uh, real-time emergency response capability that the federal government has, the US EPA has, to actually fly over a train car derailment or a chemical plant emergency ahead of ground units being deployed to actually make measurements of a chemical plume. The idea with this capability is that it flies over a chemical plant accident, a train car derailment, and it actually can detect up to 530 different chemical compounds, and it can actually uh, quantitate those uh, the amounts of chemical compounds in the uh, in the data. Next slide. We have uh, several different sensors that we use. I won't go, go over this, but if somebody like to look at the, these slides later. We Two of the uh, major sensors are called the infrared line scanner that provides an image uh, basically of a chemical plume. So 
a train car derailment happens, it creates a chemical plume. This particular device uh, uh, actually can scan that area and detect the chemical plume. It, the plume might be invisible to the eye. This is an infrared device and we detect absorptions or emissions in the mid infrared and we can actually uh, detect uh, the uh, the corners of the of the plume and the body of the plume and the concentrations. The high speed infrared spectrometer, the second sensor down, uh, it is more of a uh, the first one is a queuing device. The second one is identification and quantification device. And so it's a very narrow field to view system. These are the best uh, sensors, the best capabilities that we have as a country. Uh, and we have exactly two of these that were ever built. Uh, they were built in um, 1998, actually, and uh, they're still in operation today. They're maintained highly, and they have gone to 180 different emergency responses. Next slide. Uh, Aspect has been deployed all over the country to different train car derailments and emergency responses. And the reason I became a whistleblower and the GAP is uh, decided to represent me is I felt that there was a uh, uh, a delay in actually deploying this aircraft. If if you look at this particular slide, that aircraft can get up there to Eastern Ohio in about six hours. And it took EPA for a, a delay of four days. It was on the fifth day of the train car derailment before EPA actually collected data with this particular system. This system is the country's best capability. It, it provides, it's the only thing we have as a country to provide real time detection so it the idea is it goes out to like East Palestine, it passes over the train car derailment in six hours, and it can warn the public of impending uh, health, health effects. And so people can be evacuated. The instant commanders can look at the data and then understand what the health threats very rapidly are. And my contention in being a whistleblower was that the EPA failed in their mission to deploy this particular aircraft. They collected uh, eight minutes worth of data over East Palestine when normally they should collect 300 minutes per day of, uh, of data with this system. So they should have collected data on the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And that was not done, a very minimal set of data. And also when it came to surveying the data over the creeks, the EPA turned off the sensor. So I believe that there's numerous problems in the data collection. The public was not adequately warned of the hazard and it led to these bad decisions that were made uh, in the, um, in the safety and the health safety of the various uh, members of the public and the first responders that were out there, the firefighters, they were at risk because they had limited or no information that this particular system could have, uh, could have provided them immediately. Next slide. Just to give you an idea of what this this capability is. Uh, we have two sensors. One is the one on the right is a wide field of view imaging. It basically gives you an image that that is basically a plume coming out of a, a chemical plant in uh, Missouri, it turns out. And uh, I uh, denoted where the release point uh, was of the chemicals, that was an invisible plume. So it gives you an idea of the kind of things that this kind of sensor actually provides. It's a very powerful instrument uh, to actually detect chemicals and quantify them and really understand 
what the uh, toxic uh, uh, toxic implications uh, to basically the health and uh, welfare of the of the public. We also have this high resolution infrared spectrometer that can uh, interrogate and the smaller, uh, more narrow field of view uh, of the of the chemical plume, and it it can actually tell you what the concentration uh, is uh, down on the ground. So extremely powerful. It's our nation's only capability, and EPA failed in all counts to actually warn the public, I believe, of the impending health crisis that they were facing. Next slide. Uh, I, I'll talk about this slide. Uh, a couple of things is um, recommendations that we have is that we think that aspect airplanes should be actually utilized properly by the EPA. In fact, my colleagues believe that it, EPA is uh, so shown to be so inept at operation uh, protecting the public. They think that the, this capability should be within the National Guard or uh, 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 some place like NOAA that EPA is not not equipped to even uh, do chemical monitoring. So uh, we really worry about their uh, uh, lack of uh, knowledge and expertise in this, using this particular equipment. Even though this equipment has been used successfully in uh, 180 times, they seem to have uh, really lost all their knowledge base uh, in how to use this emergency response equipment. So just a, a complete uh, lack of understanding of the capabilities. Uh, this particular system is, uh, is suffering greatly by lack of funding. We only have one aircraft for the whole United States. We think that is putting the country at risk and the country is highly vulnerable, even for a national security uh, program. We believe that technology should be transferred to state and local municipalities, and this should not be a federal government asset any longer because the federal government deploys this thing so late and they, uh, they have to discuss for hours if they're gonna uh, basically deploy this. So we believe their deployment model is, is uh, completely inadequate for the safe, to provide safety for the federal government. And finally, we believe that technology advances uh, are really uh, improving this. So uh, um, we believe UAV uh, technology should uh, be a cost-effective solution to this application. So essentially that is the completion of my uh, talk and, and I'll be able to uh, answer questions if, if that's needed. So thank you. Last slide. Oh, okay, I was waiting for Tim, sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Robert. And, you know, somebody had already asked the question and I um, responded as to, um, you know, what's what's the future of the program, like what's being done. And we're hoping by working with Robert and other whistleblowers that we can really emphasize the importance of this program to public health as well as national security and um, and, and also expose the fact that the, the program has really dwindled in the last few years. Um, it used to go out to some 60 odd disasters, maybe on average per year. It's, correct me if I'm wrong, Robert, and it's gone down to maybe one or two disasters a year. Um, but I do want to emphasize that the East Palestine disaster was unprecedented in um, the delays. Um, it usually gets out within, you know, according to its own website, within, you know, wheels up in an hour, it can be anywhere in the U.S. within eight hours and it did not get there to the fifth day, uh, missing the entirety of the plume. And um, when it did go out, it you know didn't pick up any chemicals over the contaminated creeks because the chemical sensors were turned off. 
collecting only eight minutes of data for um, Robert and his colleagues to analyze where they usually get hundreds of minutes of data per day for each disaster. Um, some of this dwindling that's going on is that we recently, they were on a non-emergency response in Buffalo. They missed two train derailments and a hurricane. So um, we definitely need this technology in the air. We need it, you know, letting people know what they're up against in terms of these chemicals. So thank you so much, Robert. And okay, I'm, thank you, Leslie. I think we need to go to the next slide. Let's see, uh, I think maybe, oh, Kyla. Okay, so we're gonna bring Kyla in. Um, she's peer director of science policy and Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Director. So Kyla, take it away. Thanks so much, Leslie. I appreciate that. And Bob, uh, my name is Kyla Bennett. I have a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology and also a law degree. I was a former EPA employee. I worked at EPA for almost 10 years. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. So I want to talk to you today about the impact of EPA whistleblowers. I was a whistleblower myself at EPA, and I spend a lot of my job at Peer working with EPA whistleblowers. Next slide. In September of 2020, Peer was approached by five EPA employees, all from the New Chemicals Division, working on the approval or disapproval of new chemicals at EPA. Um, at, this is very unusual. When we get whistleblowers calling us, usually it's an individual. Uh, we recently had three come together in Colorado, but having five people from the same division is highly unusual. And we knew that where there's smoke, there's fire. And unfortunately, tragedies like what happened in East Palestine um, are also playing out on much smaller scale every day because of chemicals in um, factories, in consumer products, in the environment, everywhere. So it's not just these big disasters that happen that can affect uh, American public, but also everyday use of chemicals. And the, the front line, the people who protect us from chemicals um, are just 36 scientists at EPA, and we got contacted by five of them. Um, they made allegations of malfeasance uh, by management, and they before they came to us, they did try to resolve this internally. They um, talked to their managers, they talked to other people, they found no joy. So when they first contact, contacted us, we thought we could perhaps um, get rid of this malfeasance and address it through the scientific integrity policy, which has a mechanism whereby these employees can file what we call DSOs or um, differing scientific opinions. And they did that here and they didn't get any help whatsoever. So next slide, please. Um, we went um, someplace else. And what these EPA employees were alleging, and they came with receipts, they came with recordings, they came with emails, they came with um, videos, they came with everything. Um, they were saying that new chemicals managers were deleting hazards associated with chemicals. So the way it works the way it works in EPA is that when a company wants to get a new chemical on the market, they come to EPA and they say, prove to us that this chemical is not safe, that it presents an unreasonable risk, and you have 90 days to do it, because that's the framework of the law, TSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act. So what these employees were alleging is that the managers in new chemicals were actually looking at these chemicals and they were deleting hazards associated with the chemicals. In other words, they were saying things like, there's no carcinogenicity here when there was. They were also refusing to calculate some risks. Um, for example, if a chemical was corrosive, they were failing to protect workers from toxic exposures. They were withholding reports of substantial risk. There's a special section of TSCA, Section 8E, which says that if a company finds information, not even their own information, if they come across information which gives them reason to believe that their chemical will cause substantial risk of injury to human health or the environment, they have to tell EPA within 30 days. And EPA was gathering this information and it was just sitting on a desk somewhere and it wasn't being posted on the web as required. 
Um, they were also overruling scientists whenever industry or Congress called to complain. Where is my chemical? Where's my approval for this chemical? They actually called, the managers called these cases hair on fire cases and forced um, these employees to change their decisions. Next slide, please. So because we weren't getting any satisfaction internally within EPA, Peer, together with the clients, submitted numerous complaints to EPA's Inspector General. And the Inspector General is an independent watchdog group that oversees EPA, and they look into allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse. And we filed our first report with the IG in June of 2021. Next slide, please. EPA's initial response was very interesting. And we actually did, Peer did a FOIA to find out how they responded to our first complaint. In order for an employee to be covered by the Whistleblower Protection Act, they have to tell somebody in their management chain that they are a whistleblower. Otherwise, as you can probably imagine, if a whistleblower suffers from retaliation and none of their management knows that they were a whistleblower, they can say, oh, well, we didn't retaliate because they were a whistleblower. We had no idea they were a whistleblower. We fired them because they stole paper clips or because they used their government phone in inappropriately or something like that. So you have to have these clients talk to tell somebody in their management chain. In this case, um, the clients decided to tell Dr. Michal Friedhoff. She's the assistant administrator of toxics of this whole division. Um, she's a political appointee. We submitted that disclosure to her at 5.54 p.m. on June 28, 2021. Three minutes later, after receiving this 60-page disclosure, which was full of science and full of our clients' names, Dr. Friedhoff forwarded it to six people, including one of the managers implicated in the complaint. The response back from all these people who got it, it then went, as you can imagine, everywhere. Everyone in the division got a copy of this unredacted whistleblower complaint that was sent to the IG. Responses from people, this is serious, I'm not gonna say the word, and this is going to be rough. People were very, very concerned. EPA claimed that they were gonna take it very seriously and act on these allegations. Next slide, please. So EPA's next steps. They immediately conducted, they commissioned a workplace survey. Unfortunately for EPA, the survey confirmed exactly what our clients were telling us, that new chemicals was rife with industry influence and abusive mismanagement. Next slide, please. So other steps that EPA took to try to address these allegations, they issued new policy memos, they went through a reorganization of the division, and they started something called the Scientific Policy Council, which is supposed to be looking at these disagreements. Um, it is a failure, in my opinion. I can't go into too much detail about that, but none of these steps fixed any of the problems. Next slide, please. So as I said, the problems are continuing, they're continuing to this day, and EPA's baby step actions did not solve any of the ongoing problems. Luckily for our clients and for Americans, three of the managers who were implicated in our clients' disclosures have left the agency. Um, well, two of them, if not three of them, went on to industry. There is a revolving door that's going on at EPA where these managers will we had one manager who would work at EPA, go to industry, came back to EPA, worked at industry, constant revolving door. He did it four times. So three of the people that we were complaining about are now gone, which is good news, but it wasn't because of EPA's actions. Next slide, please. So there is hope, even though it's been more than three years since we submitted these uh, allegations to the inspector general, we have been in constant contact with them. They have gone above and beyond. They hired chemists. They got um, CBI clearance, confidential business information. A lot of the information that my clients were alleging, I couldn't even see because it's considered confidential business information. I'm not cleared for that. The IG got the clearance. They hired chemists. They delved into this. And from what we understand, these reports are hopefully going to start coming out this calendar year. Another hopeful thing is that one of EPA's unions, AFGI, 
got scientific integrity provisions written into their contract because the scientific integrity policy at EPA is meaningless. There's no method of enforcement. There's no way to make things right under that scientific integrity policy. It is being rewritten as we speak, but from what we've seen, it's still not good enough. Also, there's been a lot of media attention um, Sharon Lerner, when she was at The Intercept, she's now at ProPublica. She wrote a 10-part series of articles about our whistleblowers and what they were alleging. And it got a lot of attention and they continue, our clients continue to get attention from media. Next slide, please. So why are whistleblowers important? As Leslie and Bob told you in East Palestine, the fact that the IG is now looking into why the aspect plane was not deployed, why it didn't do what it was supposed to do, that was because of whistleblowers. Whistleblowers are necessary to hold EPA's feet to the fire. It doesn't matter if we've got a Democratic administration or a Republic administration, these government agencies need to be held accountable. And even when an administration changes, some of the managers stay the same. So a culture um, that may not be good for protecting human health and the environment may remain even after an administration changes. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna throw it back to Leslie. We're gonna share recommendations to improve EPA and this first slide is hers. Hey everybody, um, just get my video started here. Okay, so we put our heads together and we talked about some of the recommendations that we think would improve the EPA. Um, we have four recommendations here to um, just kind of came to mind as the most important. Under CERCLA, uh, the responsible party must pay for the cleanup, which is great, right? Uh, but a conflict of interest arises when the responsible party uh, hires all of its own contractors to conduct environmental studies and make determinations of health risk. The EPA must hire its own contractors as well as use its own available technology, such as the aspect plane, which is its gold standard on uh, chemical sensing and radiological sensing technology to the fullest extent, which it has not been doing. Uh, restore the aspect program, which is essential to national security as well as public health. Um, we have a, a part here on duty to warn, and I'll give you a little background on that, but we wanna um, see that laws are created for the EPA to consider independent science that shows health concerns that are that are not discovered by EPA or contractor testing. The EPA should immediately consider this new evidence from independent scientists and act upon it. We think that they should mandate an independent science review board that analyzes studies following a chemical release. Any analysis of existing environmental studies following a chemical release must be taken into consideration and acted upon to the right, to right the ship of these failing studies. So uh, we're just advocating for more of a voice for these independent scientists. We're advocating for uh, less uh, conflict of interest with the responsible party uh, achieving the desired outcome by hiring and uh, crafting the studies that, uh, hiring contractors that craft the studies to come up with the non-detects and the results they want. And the aspect program is key to all of this. Um, the duty to warn, I just want to emphasize real quick. Um, the duty to warn is like I had mentioned perhaps before that we had a um, petition that we turned into the EPA about a month ago. We still haven't gotten any receipt from the EPA as to whether they even received our petition. We uh, said this is an emergency duty to warn petition. They need to let people know in East Palestine, do not eat from your garden crops in your um, home gardens. Uh, our scientist um, whistleblower, Scott Smith, he found very high levels of diopsin compared to control levels, of, I mean, control samples of garlic in people's um, crops in their yards. And the EPA has been saying very early on and repeatedly to go ahead uh, from the crops. So um, there's no real basis for that. No other diopsin testing has been done on crops and uh, no actual testing in the city proper of East Palestine has been done on crops. No. So, uh, Kyla, I think next slide. Thanks, Leslie. Um, yeah, I have uh, three major recommendations to improve EPA. 
Um, first of all, EPA must have an enforceable scientific integrity framework. As you probably could tell from what I said, um, the inspector general, I have a lot of respect for them. I'm confident that they will vindicate our clients, but it takes an, a very, very long time for them to get to the bottom of these allegations, particularly when you're talking about toxicology and um, epidemiology and chemistry. Um, it's, it's heavy science. It's not easy science for people to understand. They really had to come up to speed on all of the lingo and the information, and it's taking them three years now uh, to come out with the reports. So we have to have an internal enforceable scientific integrity framework um, that, that these people can go to immediately. Second, there has to be a mechanism to punish managers who violate scientific integrity and or retaliate against whistleblowers. Waiting for them to retire or for getting too afraid of an IG investigation and resigning is not enough. These people really need to be held accountable and we need to stop retaliation. All of my clients were retaliated against um, and it, it has to stop and they have to be held accountable and they have to be named. Right now, that's not happening. And third, the culture in EPA's chemicals office must be changed such that the mission of protecting human health and the environment are at the forefront. EPA has one mission and that is to protect human health and the environment. And instead, this particular division at EPA, the one that deals with new and existing chemicals, it's it's broken. I'm just going to be very blunt. It's broken. It's not working. It's not protecting human health and the environment. And what's really frightening is that chemical pollution is one of those planetary boundaries that we have exceeded. It is killing us. In fact, I just heard today from a reporter in France who told me that there's now going to be convened an IPCC for like group for chemical pollution because we have exceeded that planetary boundary and to try to get the world to pull back on all these chemicals that we're using that are harming humans, not just here in the United States, but everywhere. But in order to do that, we first need to fix EPA and make the laws that we have work. And if the laws aren't working, we need to pass new laws that will work. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Kyla, Bob, and Leslie. If you all want to turn your cameras on, we're going to go to the live Q&A session. Um, we had 11 questions that have already been answered. Uh, I'll circle back to some of those and re-ask them. Um, but in the meantime, um, I had a general question before we jump into some of the open questions. Is I know Peer and Gap rely heavily on the Freedom of Information Act. And um, could you briefly, just very briefly, explain your experience using the Freedom of Information Act with EPA to get public information available to you? How has that process been? Has it worked? Uh, starting with me? Sure, I'll, I'll be yep. happy to answer that. Um, yeah, so we have a number of EPA um, FOIAs, as we call them, Freedom of Information Act requests out there. Um, we've had some of them come back, and they have been very good. Um, you know, there's always redactions, but I think they've been really helpful, and uh, we found out a lot of really good information uh, by filing them. So I think it's an essential part of what we do. Um, so, I mean, we did have to sue the EPA um, writing our first FOIA on East Palestine because they had denied us expedited processing and a fee waiver, which has never happened in GAP's 46-year uh, history. Uh, and we were mainly looking for information on dioxins and information on our whistleblower, Scott Smith, who had found dioxins in the community. But that that ended up working out. We uh, we got what we needed and, and we got expedited processing. But yeah, Thank very you, important. Thank you, Kyla? Yeah, um, I agree with Leslie that FOIA is an amazing tool. We'd be lost without it. Um, however, uh, I find that EPA is really reluctant to give us the information we need. And I'm going to give you an example. Recently, um, a couple months ago, we FOIA'd for emails 
between and among four EPA employees over a two-day period. And EPA told us it would take about a year to get those documents to us. Um, so um, we've been pushing back. We still don't have them months later. They claim there are 662 documents. I don't see how that can be possible. We just are looking for emails and text messages between four people over two days on one specific issue, not all of their emails. It just doesn't seem right. So um, we end up in court a lot with EPA over these FOIAs, and we find um, that there's, it's very difficult to get information out of them. Once you do get that information, it's often very helpful, except for the redactions, particularly under CBI, which EPA overuses all the time. As a reminder, CBI is confidential business information. Great. I'm going to move to a question from Art Milholland that I think is a general high-level question that's been touched on a bit, but maybe you can touch on it briefly and directly. Are there funding and political pressures that degrade EPA leadership policies and enforcement? Kyla? Absolutely. Um, for example, mm -hmm. in the TASCA office, Dr. Michal Friedhoff, the assistant administrator, has been before Congress begging for more funds um, constantly, mm -hmm. and she never gets them. Mm -hmm. The reason these scientists cannot do their job is because they don't have enough resources. They do not have enough funding. And unfortunately, EPA is one of those agencies who always seems to get the short shrift. They need to at least double their budget to, do, to be able to do the job that they're doing. And EPA is also a very politically susceptible agency. Um, congressionals feel free to call up EPA and tell them, you know, do this or don't do this or do that. I mean, one of the one of the things that I was a whistleblower on when I was at EPA doing enforcement was that EPA was allowing congressionals into settlement negotiations for enforcement cases, totally inappropriate. Um, so very politically susceptible. Budgeting is a huge problem. Bob, in your the program you were working on, one plane for the whole country. How is your yeah. funding? Funding is basically non-existent. Uh, so we uh, built this uh, airplane, essentially the sensors uh, out of the Department of Defense, and they've not been added or upgraded uh, since two, uh, 2001 by EPA. So uh, dereliction of duty and not providing any support for uh uh, emergency first responders for detection of chemicals. It's just mind blowing that our we let our capabilities degrade to the, this point. And Leslie, what are your thoughts on funding political pressures that you've experienced in your work? Right. Um, you know, I feel like with with just this Norfolk Southern situation that's going on and the derailment that. They have a lot of power in the lobbying department, right? They're out there lobbying all the time for what they want. And I think that does influence um, not just our congressional leaders and our senators, but I think it really influences the way EPA handles things. And I think it shouldn't be that way, but that's how it appears. It appears that the EPA is almost like the public relations arm, Norfolk Southern here, um, you know, furthering the nothing to see here narrative that you know, there is something definitely going on, but it's not the narrative you get out of the EPA and it's, um, it doesn't make sense unless there's some kind of influence. Okay. I'm going to pull a question that was already answered and I'm going to ask it again for you, Leslie. I think it's a good question. There are a lot of different federal agencies involved in responses. Um, wouldn't FEMA also have a role in the emergency response? Were they involved at all? Yes, they were. And um, that's been a real mystery to us because um, we just recently, well, several months ago, we did a FOIA on to FEMA asking what happened to James McPherson, who is um, works for FEMA. And the president said, we, we want you to go and assess the unmet needs in East Palestine. And I think the residents there were hoping for some kind of you know, medical care for life or um, you know, uh, medical monitoring and, and possibly relocation assistance to get out, get away from the dangers. And this report was due months ago. Um, it hasn't been seen and we're still waiting on our, our FOIA <laughs> to find out what happened there. So that's a great question. 
I'm also going to circle back to a question that's been answered, but kind of broaden it out a bit, both for you, Leslie and Kyla, briefly, and then I'll get into some of the open questions. But can you discuss specific evidence of industry influence at play, both in East Palestine and Kyla in the New Chemicals Division, and maybe pick out one example, uh, or in pesticides where we work often, um, to show indus- you know actual industry influence? Sure. Or Kyla, go ahead. Uh, Sure. Um, As I mentioned briefly in my talk, um, EPA Mm -hmm. in the new chemicals division actually has something called hair on fire cases. So Mm -hmm. industry calls management and says, I want my chemical approved now. Where is it? How come it's not out? And they immediately, you know, stamp that file hair on fire Mm -hmm. and berate the scientists who haven't gotten the the chemical risk assessment done um, and sometimes take it away from them and give it to somebody who will just rubber stamp it and let it go through. Um, that's as direct of industry influence as, as I can think of, but there are, there are many ways um, that it happens, but that that is one where they just call up and say, I need this and managers say, oh, okay, sorry, we'll get it to you and it happens. Leslie? Yeah, um, I have an example that involves the aspect airplane um, during the BP uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, And I I think that when it comes to EPA, in my experience, not all regions are created equally um, in terms of um, their um, sufficiency and their response, how robust they are. But Region 4 said to um, somebody within the aspect that they didn't want they did not want the uh, aspect flying over the waters of region to locate oil. Like they realized they could find the oil, but um, it was very good for that. Um, and they didn't want that to happen. So um, I, I don't know, you know, if that came down from BP or where it came down from, but it's just, it's, it's just an example of some, somebody's influencing that somewhere. <laughs> Right. And Region 4 is based in Atlanta, but covers much of the Gulf Coast and Southeast, for those that yes. don't know. I live in Region 4. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Diana Conway asks, and I think this is a um, really important question. So when you have to sue for enforcement of a valid FOIA, you send a Freedom of Information Act in, you don't get an answer, you sue them. Do courts ever punish EPA for slow walking their response in your experience? Well, I'm, I'm kind of new to the whole uh, suing the EPA for these types of things. Um, in one example that I mentioned earlier, uh, we ended up mediating, right, with the EPA in terms of what we wanted and, and trying to come to a compromise, right, on how to how soon to get the documents and how to lay them out and what we could agree upon. So I don't know about the punishment. I, I don't know. Uh, Kyla, would you know more about that? Yeah, I've never seen them be punished, but they do. It, when we win, the EPA has to pay our attorney fees. Um, so it, uh, that's a form of punishment, I guess. But individual people don't get punished, at least nothing that is visible to us. And and I have to say that a lot of the FOIA officers that I work with are quite good at EPA. So it's not necessarily their fault. It might be the Office of General Counsel or maybe the programmatic office that's not giving them the documents. The FOIA officers want to give us what we are asking for. Um, so there's a lot of tension. It's So you can't paint EPA with one broad brush and say they're all bad. There are some wonderful people there. And a lot of the FOIA officers are wonderful. Um, so punishment not so much, but they do have to pay when we win. They have to pay for our attorney fees. Great. Well, I wanted to mention too, real quick, just a caveat to that, Tim, if that's okay. Um, I do notice that when we do FOIAs, there's a lot of redactions for a deliberative process. So, you know, it's not just um, if they're talking to their attorney, but if they're deliberating about how to publicly present a situation, we don't get those conversations. And I find that highly frustrating because you just end up with so much that's, you know, gone that you can't see <laughs> so right. but we can we can sue if that gets uh, bad enough so go ahead so bob a uh, question for you or anyone yes. else panel that might know but might the use of drones to collect samples with analysis 
performed by ground stations be a less expensive method? Do you know anything yeah. about evolving techniques? Yes, we're working on that right now. I'm um, I'm investigating uh, doing that, and we we have some prototype drone systems that are remote sensors. These uh, the devices I'm talking about are uh, remote sensing applications. They don't have to suck in a sample uh, with the drone. They they view it. Uh, through uh, some optical system. So you don't have to have the system in the plume itself. So there's some advantages in doing that. There's advantages, uh, other advantages in sucking in a sample. But uh, we're a uh, remote sensor application and uh, we think that drones are the future of this uh, system we think state and locals need to have this instead of the one one aircraft for the whole country that's uh, operated by the federal government that somebody in Washington DC will decide oh we don't need it it's it's not necessary and Bob when you say we could you clarify um we're not uh, I mean we we EPA yeah oh we EPA so EPA is yeah. looking to it okay uh, well, really uh, yeah, there's a uh, Department of Defense is actually looking at the use of drones for chemical chemical detections. And it might be possible in the future to have like the National Guard, the uh, something called the CST teams uh, that are operated by the state government uh, to have this kind of capability. Right. Well, I wanted to do a time check. We're coming up on three minutes to five, and we want to make sure people Eastern time um, are able to leave at five. There's a couple questions left. Um, one is hoping we can connect with the Harris campaign. Uh, so one thing I think just to highlight out of this is it's really important for everyone to get active politically and to make sure toxic pollution is an issue that your elected officials care about. Um, it's often until recently not been, but the momentum is gathering behind reform for toxics and we need to keep pushing. Um, just quickly, has EPA had Michael Reagan said or done in response to these problems? Um, Leslie, just briefly, East Palestine, uh, what have you heard from the administrator? The administrator had come out pretty early on in this response and uh, touted the great technology from the aspect plane as part of the reason why they know that there's low or no detections of chemicals in the environment. And um, that was not something that he could hang his hat on, so to speak, because they didn't go out for five days and they missed the information that was in the plume and then turned the sensors off over the greens. Um, since uh, Robert's disclosure, they have come out with sort of a list of um, talking points as to why they didn't fly. Um, and uh, Government Accountability Project has researched every single one of their talking points. And um, pretty much we've turned in a, a statement that to the um, inspector general that shows line by line, all of those are um, not valid. And Kyla, has Administrator Reagan been involved in the new chemical whistleblower issues? No. Um, aside from very broad statements that he's issued about how he values scientific integrity and won't tolerate, you know, retaliation against whistleblowers, blah, blah. There's been nothing, absolutely nothing. Great. Well, we are approaching five, so I am going to uh, wrap it up. Um, I will just uh, quickly answer Diana Conway asked about European agent agencies. Europe is uh, obviously ahead of us on most chemical issues because there's less uh, corporate influence. There's still corporate influence, but uh, certainly much less than in the United States where it takes a lot of money to run campaigns and stay, into off, stay in office. But I wanted to uh, thank all of you for joining us. We felt this was a very important issue. I know toxic chemicals and whistleblower issues are very important to GAP, very important to PEER. 
And we're going to continue to shine the light on these issues and do everything we can to reform EPA to make it more responsive to all of you, to the public, to science, and to those that are impacted by um, toxic pollution. We hope if you're not following Peer and not signing up for our emails that you do, uh, and likewise for the Government Accountability Project, um, please sign up for their emails. We will follow up uh, with all of you on um, uh, with an email on these presentations and how you can contact us for further questions. And we'll certainly keep you apprised of what's happening with East Palestine and the five whistleblowers that Peer represents. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.